my presentation is up here, and I heard a couple people um, talking about how they read the poem and looking at each stanza. So actually, that's what I did too. So each of my um, pieces of my presentation actually has looks at each of the stanzas. So if I, my prez is going to do what I want it to do here. So here's the first stanza of that poem. So out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. And <clears throat> this is a picture of my high school, which doesn't exist anymore. They've torn it down and rebuilt a brand new high school and changed the name and all that jazz. And it just opened this, um, this, this year. So what I did was think about um, Invictus moment. The, for me, what I think about in this poem are, are these moments in your life where you either knowing, sometimes unknowingly, take charge and make decisions. So one of the ways that I interpret this first part is that I explained that my family moved around a lot <laughs> when I was growing up. So between second and 11th grade, we moved at least nine times around the city of Detroit. So by the time I got to the 11th grade, I decided that I was not going to change schools anymore. I don't care where they moved, I was not going to change schools. Um, and one of the things that I experienced gets me to say this day is when people ask me where I'm from, I say I'm from Detroit, and they ask me where, and I tell them everywhere. <laughs> I am from uh, the city of Detroit. <laughs> so the other thing that decision, when I said I made that decision, and the reason I made that decision is because what I found out is that I, I was, in 11th grade, I was too close to something different. I didn't know exactly what that was, but it was something. So I was too close to something different to um, let the routine of, like right here, urban, inner city, nomad life keep me running in circles. So I decided, no. Not anybody out loud or anything like that. I just decided, once we moved again, I just wouldn't move schools. And I just get to school however um, and from wherever I could. So for me, that was one of those moments I, that I'm now calling Invictus moments that I made a decision. And then everything that came after the decision, I hadn't thought through at all. I just, I knew what I was not going to do um, anymore. And then looking at the, the circumstances of where I was. So that's how I kind of interpret the first part of the poem. Anybody else want to share anything about their first impressions or how they may have, what it means to them? Or is it making sense when I'm talking about these moments that you, yes, I'll give them the mic, right? Yeah. I get to be like talk show host. <laughs> uh, no, my, my interpretation though, and then I thought about how my life had changed from from day to night. That I was one time living a real crazy life, and then when I got into school, things changed. My my attitude changed. My perception of life changed, and then the things that I continued to do changed, and it changed the people around me as well. Any other sharers? And this is why I didn't work out this morning, because I figure I'd walk around the room briskly handing the mic over. Well, my interpretation on the first stanza was somewhat similar to yours um, when it came to different circumstances that sometimes are beyond control in life, um, such as uh, family matters. Um, children may come to play the absence of parents, things that a child wouldn't necessarily have control over. Me, personally, I wasn't raised by my mother or father. I was raised by my grandmother. And um, circumstances just like that, I had no control over what my mom or dad did. I was a little bitty kid, but stuff like that made my life different because it forced my grandmother to begin to shape me in different forms and fashion and begin to um, mold different things to come out of me that necessarily wouldn't have if I was raised by my mother and father. So those inviticus moments like that when um, life just seems to take place and you have no control over it, but you have to flow with it and hopefully that you come out with some type of positive um, result at the end of it. So um, that's how I feel about the first stanza. All right. Um, and again, to try to tie this back to <coughs> our hope of getting engaged in the community in a way that whatever our service ends up being at the end of this academic school year, 
hopefully will inspire some of the moments that we're talking about in um, the people that we engage with through that service. All right, so circumstances, I took basically words from each of the stanzas. And again, if this stanza way of talking about it doesn't work for you and you want to say something, there's really no order that you have to, you can engage how you want to. Um, so that second stanza, in the fell of clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. And again, I'm sort of still in that same sort of area. This is um, how I interpret that, continuing my sort of, that decision I made that I wasn't going to change schools anymore. Well, that meant that at some point, I had to take three different buses to get to school. And what I remember about that time the most was in the winter time when I had to take three buses to get to school and how just terrifying that trip was. Now, we're talking about 1985. How terrifying that trip was for me to have to get up in the dark and walk to the bus stop, that first of many bus stops. Um, I don't think Detroit has ever in my lifetime had all functioning streetlights, like ever. So <laughs> getting that, um, having that trip was really, um, it was a scary thing um, at 16 years old and having to, it doesn't seem that scary, but many things happened that we didn't talk about trying to get from your house to school. So that was one of those things that I was determined, and, and, I'm, and, I, and I did it, and I did it for a while until my mom could move someplace closer to the school because she saw that I was not going to change high school because <laughs> it was just too close. And this is not a real picture of Detroit. It was just the most creepiest picture I could find <laughs> to sort of display <laughs> display my 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 walk to school um, to the bus. All right. So this idea of making decisions and um, that another to continue that is these moments of having to um, find myself and who I am. Like when I made that decision. I had no idea that at one point I'd be walking in the dark of winter to try to get to school. But that's where I was and that's what I did. Um, because it was, what am I to say? It was, it was easier not to, but I had so many examples of people not doing things that it was time that I wanted to do something different. Um, so any other, anybody wanna, I can keep with my presentation and if this someone wants to chime in does it make you want to share anything? You want me to keep going? Okay. I mean, and um, it's so funny because I'm a real believer on um, not giving up on yourself. Um, sometimes in life, um, especially when you're talking, to, um, not to be offensive to anyone, but when you're talking to a minority group of young men, um, sometimes when we make mistakes as younger brothers growing up, um, a lot of times society will deem that we have no chance at getting it right. Um, you might even have the closest people to you that seem to tell you that you can't get it right. So with that last, um, I believe that last line where he said, my head is bloody but still unbowed, that speaks so many volumes because you can't control some of the blows that's going to come your way. But I think us as young men, we just need to realize that we can still take it and still hold our head high, fix our tie, fix our trousers, and we can still walk towards the path that we need to walk to. No one is saying we're going to be perfect. I'm not saying go commit crazy crimes thinking that's okay, saying that's a mistake. But uh, <laughs> missing a homework assignment, get it together. Not that big of a deal. No need to drop out. Not completing the class successfully the first time. Don't give up. Try it again. You see what I mean? So um, I feel like even though we're going to take those bloody blows, we got to keep our head up and keep moving towards the mark, okay? But that's it. Um, thank you very much. So that third stanza, beyond this place of wrath and tears, loom but the horror of the shade, and let the menace of the years find and shall find me unafraid. So. <coughs> my interpretation of that, here's a picture of my family. I'm the little girl in the blue. 
Um, so continuing that same thought. Um, so that's my mom, that's me, and I'm number 12 of, no, yeah, I'm 12 of 13 kids. So I have a brother who's like, mm, just a few months younger than me, I guess. Um, so continuing that thought, when I am um, thinking about this moment, making that decision and those bus rides, um, and I'm going to read this one straight off. So the only thing that made my midnight winter morning bus stop walk more worrisome were the days my mother decided I would be safer if she walked with me. Those days of no cell phones and occasional, <coughs> occasional home service got to be, I got to be frightened for myself until I made it to school and frightened for my mom until I made it home at the end of the day to know that she made it home. But I did not change schools. <laughs> because, and this takes us to the last stanza. Um, I master my fate, I captain my soul. So as you see, I'm just snatching pieces of the poem as I go through. Um, anybody has, there you go. Oh, I'm gonna come, since he's so close, I'll go, then come over to you. So um, this one actually means a lot to me, actually. Just because the way I see it is, well, if you wanna do something in life, you have a dream, you have to go after it. No one else is gonna tell you what to do or no one else is gonna be able to stop you, really, if you're really, want to go after it, but I don't know. I'm not really a good public speaker, so I'll just hand this off to the next person. <laughs> no, I'm oh, no, I'm good, man. That is my whole point. <laughs> All right, I'll come over. No, I'm just going to read what I wrote at that particular time. I, I kind of had one of those little moments at 3 o'clock in the morning, too, when I had to get up and write this, but it says, the last stanza to me says, no matter, it says, no matter not the direction that I travel or how I maintain my peace with myself or with others around me, no matter what government, courts, or the people say, I am the one who judges my rights or wrongs, the one who deems my consequences. I am the one who has the, to accept how I live with the outcome of this call on my life. Thank you. I'll try to be very brief. I'm Dave Selman, and I'm the director of the, Lear of the Learning Corners of Adult Education here at the college. And I also co coach basketball for 20 years. And I just feel that this is a time that I must say this, is that people talk about, people always tell me, Dave, you know, all my friends, that are laid off right now and, and that are not doing maybe as well as I'm doing right now. And when I think about this, I, when, when, when they were sitting at home in their apartments, because I came to school here 30 something years ago, I was going to school, okay? I was, we had to walk. I was recruited here to play basketball for Mansfield, Ohio. We had to walk over seven, eight miles to get to school if the bus was running. If the bus was running, of course we took the bus. But there was times that I sacrificed, okay? I sacrificed because I wanted, I wanted to dress nicely. I wanted, to, I wanted to be able to provide for my family. I wanted to be able to do all these things. And the moment that you guys are in right now is crucial. You can underestimate this if you want. Your ability to make money five, six years from now will all depend on what you do right now. For people that don't have a degree, they're predicting that you will make $800,000 over your 30-year working career, a 40-year working career. People that have one will make $1.8 million. What am I saying to you? It's worth a million dollars to you to get your degree, what you're doing right now. I just wanted to make sure I said this to you before I left today. Because I see you, I see me, sitting down right now with you guys. Right <coughs> Trust me, get it done. Get it done. All right, 
right, so my interpretation for this last part is just was a reminder. So this is the end of my little narrative, my story, my Invictus moment is when I was 16, I decided I would not switch high schools and increase my chances of becoming the master of my fate and the captain of my soul. So that's one of those. And I, in reading this poem and asking you to do it, I think one of the things is once I sat down and I thought in that, that experience, that decision came to my mind, I start to see all these other decisions that came to my mind. So again, at thinking about stringing these moments of victory together, no matter how small they may be, and taking a second and looking at them, might actually help you make the next decision you know, a little easier, a little better, and a little more positive as you start to string those pieces together. Um, and then the last thing I found, which I thought was really creative here, is um, another version of Invictus, and my musician friend might appreciate this.
we had uh, my interpretation and thanks everyone for who did share because the thing is, is a, it's a narrative and it's a story um, and it can be told in a whole bunch of different ways. But before you can tell it, you have to think about it and you have to find it and you have to be willing to consider what it means. So invictive moments, they lead to connections. Those connections lead us to engagement. And these are some things that I think we really need to think about as we prepare for whatever that civic engagement once we say we're gonna go out to the community and do whatever it is we want to do. Gotta think here first before we can think out there. So I encourage everyone to take today's discussion and please feel free to go to Blackboard and upload any of your comments and at any point but by the time I see you. Our next meeting is gonna be in January and then we'll get back to talking about specific ways and what we're gonna do in the community. So. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate, I appreciate you know, Marissa Bottle being here and, and, and sharing. And the thing that I, that I want you to take to heart is what she's driving you to do is to do ref, uh, reflective thinking. And sometimes that's not easy to do. When you do reflective thinking, you not only see the good, you see the bad. You know? Um, but you have to see the bad because you don't know, what's, you know, you don't know what to fix you know, if you don't spend time doing some self-reflections. And um, the other thing I like about this poem, the poem to me talks about, you know, um, failure is not an option. You know, life hits us, so what? You know, uh, the bottom line is <clears throat> when life comes, you know, we will rise to the challenge. And that's part of what we talk about in this program here. A lot of things will hit us, you know, unexpectedly, uh, things we never thought we'd have to encounter. Um, so what? You know, we have to rebound anyway and make it anyway. Uh, you gentlemen, you gentlemen of the first class of ABO. And from now on, other young men will be coming in this program looking to the example that you set. You know, and y'all didn't realize y'all were setting yourself up for all that, but you know, uh, you know and that's what you are. You know, Charles Barkley made a comment, you know, about not being, you know, the example, and I disagree with that. I think we all are examples. We don't have the option of choosing not to be the example or the model. You know, we are the model, and we're set in the mode right now. Um, <clears throat> I have a special, special friend, gentleman, I want to introduce to you right now, and um, <clears throat> Dr. Damon Arnold. And um, I'm going to read his, um, his uh, just his biography, but he's going to spend some time with us, and I think you will find him uh, engaging. And uh, I've asked him to challenge you, and uh, there will be some some Q and Q and A at the, at the end, uh, question answers. He will engage you. And I I challenge you to challenge him. You know, if y'all bad, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so challenge him back. Okay, let me read, tell you a little bit about <coughs> Dr. Arnold. I'm gonna grab, what is this, my glass? Hold up, I, I, I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> I have glasses. I'm sorry, you got my back. Oh, yeah. Matter of yeah. fact, I'm gonna, let, I, I'm gonna let Andre read this since he got my back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke too soon, right? Okay. Mr. Dr. D.F. Arnold. I'm going to read it right off the paper. Don't read it all. Don't read it all? Okay. Okay. Dr. Arnold is, Arnold is a native of Cleveland, Ohio. He is an author, consultant, and motivational speaker. He provides training in leadership and motivation to a wide range of groups, including professionals, executives, athletes, students, and individuals across the United States. And so, I don't want to read the rest, but I, I will say this. Uh, when I heard, I read his bio online, and the thing that stood out to me was that he had a, a great understanding of the psychology of success and the psychology of failure. And whether you're successful or failure in this culture, in this country, is going to be determined on how you think and how you think about yourself, how you think about life, and how you think about your future. So when he's giving his message, I want you guys to kind of filter it through that. How do I need to think um, as not only um, a student, but also as a black man, how do I need to think in this country in order to ensure my success? So uh, I'm sure he's going to give a relevant word. Uh, put your hands together for Dr. Arnold. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. All right, all right. I got two speeches, all right? I got the one that's Dr. Damon Arnold. Well, I got Damon and let's talk. Which one y'all want? Because I ain't really have one over there. I ain't really, I ain't really had that one. All right. Someday somebody's going to say, no, I want to hear that one. I'll be like, ooh. ooh. 
I can put that one on too. But all right, so so I like to have fun when I'm giving my presentations when I'm talking because I feel like I can't be this Dr. Damon Arnold guy without telling you who I am. So a little bit about me, I got kicked out of two different high schools. I graduated from an alternative school. I went to a community college. So I didn't know this Dr. Damon Arnold existed inside of me. So I don't really get off on that. Now understand, it's different times where you gotta put a different set of lenses on. I work at Grand Valley State University. I work with student athletes. And so me and my student athletes, we have a good relationship. But they're not coming to see Dr. Damon Arnold. They're not doing that. We need to have a conversation. So when we're conversing, they're coming to see Damon and we have real talk. But one thing I challenge them is, we gonna take you to the level where you need to be, but I'm gonna meet you where you are. Because I feel like that's the job as educators. So with that said, I talked to them about putting a different set of lenses on. You gotta talk differently in certain situations. You can't talk the same all the time. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? Because you can't be that person. Remember Dave Chappelle when he had keep, when keeping it real go wrong? Y'all yeah. remember that? All right, yeah. yeah. Keeping it real go wrong. You can't keep it real all the time. Sometimes you have to play the game. You have to play the game. All right, so got kicked out of two different high schools. You leaving, man? You ain't leaving, are you? Because I'm about to, it's about to get kind of hot in here. Baby. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I was trying to get the cup. So Hold on, here you go, man. <laughs> Give my man a cup. That's all he wanted was a cup. He came over here looking for a cup. Here you go. All right, all right, so let's have some fun. So first of all, I want to show you this video, all right? I'm going to show you this video, and this is a video of how they train fleas. So how they train fleas. And it's crazy. When I first seen this video, I was like, man. All right, check this out. Training fleas requires a glass jar with a lid. The fleas are placed inside the jar, and the lid is then sealed. They are left undisturbed for three days. Then, when the jar is opened, the fleas will not jump out. In fact, the fleas will never jump higher than the level set by the lid. Their behavior is now set for the rest of their lives. And when these fleas reproduce, their offspring will automatically follow their example. So, so you mean to tell me you have fleas that can jump, but because they put that lid on, because they put that lid on, they don't jump any higher than that lid. And what happens is the offspring, if y'all heard that part, they're watching their mom and dad jump to that lid and get their head hit. So they thinking, So all of a sudden, when they learn to jump, they only jump so high. So I grew up in, 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 in a single parent household with just my mother. So my mother understood, and she was the only one in my family, because I'm the only one in my family to this day to go to college and graduate. And so my mother always said, all right, boy, education, education. That's what she told I had that one person who was in my head talking about education education, but I was still getting in all kinds of trouble. Because remember, my mother crossed a different bridge than the bridge I needed to go across. She couldn't teach me how to go across that bridge to manhood. She couldn't, because she went across a totally different bridge. So I had to piece together what a man was through all my friends and everything. But one thing I didn't do is I never gave up. I never gave up. Even though I was getting in all this trouble, I never gave up. And that one person who never gave up on me was my mother. So all of y'all in this room got one person. Everybody in this room got one person. And you might say, no, I don't. Yes, you do, because you got you. You got you. And you have to make a choice not to give up on you. So if you ain't got nobody else, you be that one person. It's up to you. Because success is truly in your hands. 
how the heck did I get kicked out of two different high schools and graduate from a continuation school, and now all of a sudden I'm Dr. Dane Harvey? <laughs> I mean, it only happens through perseverance. I wasn't a 4.0 student. I wasn't. I was terrible in school. But what's crazy is I don't like math to this day. I don't like science to this day. But in order to get my degrees, I had to do those subjects. But what happened was I started asking for help. I started asking for help. And then I found out some people like math. They crazy, but they like math. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, also don't like science. But what I found out was some people like science. So I started putting myself around those people who can help me with my deficiencies. And what's interesting is it was some things that I was good at that they weren't good at. And I was able to help them. We shared an experience together but it was because I opened my mouth. So it's kind of like, little boy, little boy, oh, oh, you know what, before I can get to the story of little boy, hold on, I got to show y'all something, because I would be remiss if I don't do this, hold on. I got to show y'all something right quick. All right, so, so whenever I do these presentations, right, whenever I do these presentations, I always got to talk about, because I feel like, you know, we got to be family, all right? Can we be family? Can we be family? So I'm going to introduce y'all to my family, but everything we say, stay in the room, all right? Because me and my wife, when I tell you a couple stories, we had to go counseling over some stuff, all right? So it stays in the room, cool? We go, all right, cool. Who the hell are the only ones going to tell you? Anybody? Okay, cool, that's what I like to hear. Oh, dang. <laughs> I always got to be one. All right, so first person I got to introduce y'all to is my wife, Sherelle Arnold. Me and Sherelle have been married 14 long, long, oh shoot, good years, baby. Good years. 14 good years. All right, so 14 good years. Next person I got to introduce y'all to, this person right here. Hold on, time out. How y'all laughing? <laughs> see, see, it killed me when I show that picture and people be laughing because I be like, what if that was his real teeth? <laughs> you know, that kind of hurt my feelings. But that's DJ. So I'm going to tell y'all some stories about DJ because my kids helped me become the person I am today. It's people who have played an important role in who you are today. All right, so the last person I got to introduce y'all to is this girl right here. That's Alani. Yes, she do got cornflakes in her hair, but that's the star of the house right there. That's my baby. Let me give a better picture. So that's Alani. So that's my family. So first story I got to tell you is about this little boy, and uh, he was walking down the street. Little boy, probably about nine years old, same age as my son, about nine years old, and they're walking down the street, right? And, and the father says to the son, he says, son, you see that big old rock right there? Son, you can move that rock. And the son looked at his daddy, he was nine years old. He like, I can't, I can't move that rock. He was like, son, you can move that rock. He was like, man, I can't move that rock, daddy. Son, you can move that rock. So the son go over to the rock and he start pushing. So he do it again. He's like, all right, my daddy said I can move it, so I must can move it because my daddy said I can move it. So he go to the rock again. Uh, rock still ain't moving. And so he stopped. He's like, daddy, see, I told you I couldn't move that rock. And the, and the father said, stop, 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 son. You could move that rock. You just didn't try everything. He's like, daddy, I did. I tried everything. I pushed real hard. He was like, son, stop. You didn't try everything. He's like, all right, well, maybe I didn't try everything. I got to bend my knees. I got to bend my knees. He go back over. Uh, he pushing, rock ain't moving. He pushing, now with all this, he just, uh, and all of a sudden he starts crying. Pushing, he's just crying. And the father is over looking at his son, and the father's looking, and the father starts to cry a little bit too. Because the son is just, you can tell he's getting frustrated and everything, and he just gives up and he stops. And he looks at his father with tears just running down his face. He said, Daddy, see, I told you, I couldn't move that rock. And the father said, as he wiped his eyes, he said, son, son, stop crying. You could have moved that rock, son. You could have moved it. He was like, no, I couldn't, daddy. I told you I couldn't. He said, son, stop. You could have moved that rock. He said, son, you did try everything. I did try everything. No, you didn't. Son, I'm standing right here, and you didn't ask me to help you. I would have helped you move that rock, son, but you didn't ask me. 
Men, you can't be so prideful that you're not asking for help. You have to ask for help. If you ask for help, people at this university, they will help you. They will help you because they needed help. You know, I say a lot of times when I go speak to different people, and depending on what I'm speaking about, if you think about all the successful people, they're successful, they're successful because they ask for help. Someone helped them along the way. I don't know if it's some Jordan fans or some, some Kobe fans. I don't know who in the room, but they all got coaches. They all had people to help them. If you want to move rocks, if you want to move obstacles, if you want to move different things that will get in your way, because that's what life is. Life is going to test and see if you really want it. Nobody's immune to it. Everybody's going to go through something. Nobody's immune to it. But who are you going to ask to help you go through it? Because remember, if everybody's going through something, why do you feel like it's just you? And why make a decision based on what you're going through right now? Because who you are right now is not going to be who you will be in the future. Decisions and choices, man. You got to continuously make better ones. Decisions and choices. Continuously make better ones. And you're going to be all right. Does that story make sense? All right. And you right here, man, with the little, I, I like y'all. Y'all real fly right now, too. And tell the truth. Do y'all feel differently when y'all got y'all ties on? All right, this wasn't even on the script. But I remember when I first started, because Monday through Thursday, I got suits on. I'd be suited and booty. But then on Friday, and when I go speak, I like to wear just a sports coat and some jeans, because I like to put my swag like this, you know? And so I remember when I first wore suits, and First of all, I believe people will help you based on you asking for help, and I believe people will help you based on who you are and what you're exhibiting. People like positive people. People don't like to be around negative people. And so I remember wearing a suit, my first suit. I was working for this university, and I was about to go, I was about to go recruit, and I was about to go recruit students to come up to the university. And I had this suit on, and, 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 and it was a white man named Dr. Scott who changed my life. It was a Asian men who changed my life. They didn't look like me, but they changed my life. So the whole race thing, I don't really get off on that because I think the most important being on this earth is the human being. And I believe people will help you. No matter how you look and how they look, it's about your spirit, what you project. So I had my suit on and I was feeling real clean. And I remember this white gentleman opened up the door and said, here you go, sir. I was like, oh, sure. <laughs> he called me sir because I had a suit on. Because you can imagine if my pants was hanging down, it would have been a totally different conversation. Right, wrong, or indifferent, it's a totally different conversation. Understand that, gentlemen. You're being based and looked at on how you dress sometimes. I mean, come on, y'all see it now, because y'all y'all older in the room. Y'all older in the room. Y'all not as young as y'all once was. I know we still got that dream of playing in the NBA and NFL, but <laughs> let it go, baby. Let it go. All right. <laughs> but, but. And I ain't trying to crush none of y'all because I still wait for the call from the Lions. Yeah. I'm still wait, so I feel you. But, but I can't stand when I'm walking down the street now and dudes got their pants just because I got a nine-year-old in the car who's trying to figure this whole thing out. Daddy said this ain't cool, but that, ain't, that, that gotta be cool because all the boys is wearing their pants down here. Okay? You have to decide what's cool based on what you think is cool. Here go my first story, I gotta tell you. Alright, so here we go. So, so I'm a big Jordan fan. I'm a big Jordan fan. When I found out I was having a little boy, anybody got some kids in the room? Anybody got kids in the room? Alright, so, so y'all know how I feel, but I'm gonna bring y'all that don't have kids, I'm gonna bring y'all up to, to how I was feeling. So my wife told me we was having. We was having a little boy. All right, so I'm about to have my, my little mini me. I'm about to have a boy. Shoot. He about to be sharp, boy. He about to be tight, my little boy. So the first thing to make my little boy tight, when I found out I was having a little boy, because nine years ago, I said, man, I go home, and I got just boxes, seven boxes full of Jordans. Because Jordans was the shoe of choice. I don't know about now, but nine years ago, 
you had Jordans on, you was it. And so my son had to have Jordans because Jordans are cool. And so I come home with seven boxes, and my wife just looked at me and laughed and because I bought them at the Foot Locker clearance, at the Foot Locker outlet. So I was getting Jordans for like $10, $15, okay, because it was at the clearance. So I get home, and she just laughed and like, and I was like, hey, my son got to have Jordans. Cool, because I wanted to be in the mall walking with my son. People like, oh, look how cute he is. Oh, and look at his little Jordans. I used to like it. It made me feel real good. I don't know about y'all. That made me feel good. Like I was daddy of the year. So, so when he was almost two, he ain't have a pair of Jordans to fit him. And so I told my wife, I said, hey, 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 tomorrow we gotta wake up and go get my my son some Jordans, cause Jordans, cool. So we wake up, get him up in the morning. He about to be two. And so, so we wake up, put him in the back seat because we got the navigator, I ain't got no minivan. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so I had a little navigator. And so right. he in the back. So we, we get him to the mall and we put him in the stroller. So he in the stroller. And you know, he about to be two when you know at two, they ain't got really control of their neck. So he just doing that. That part ain't cool, all right? Because you know, he be drooling it. I can't stand that right there. But, all right, so we get, so we got the stroller, we got the stroller, we go to Foot Locker, right? Because before I bought my Foot Locker outlet, so I got to go get my son some Jordan. So I had the girl say, hey, what are Jordans to fit my son? He was like, oh, sir, they're over there. So I go over there, I'm like, yeah, sh you about to be tight, boy. He's like, he don't know. <laughs> so get the Jordans, I pick them up, I'm like, about that big. I'm like, ooh, $50. Because, yeah, I didn't know that. I bought them for clearance. I'm like, ooh. So I'm thinking of the George special. He ain't too, he ain't jumping that high right now. And so I'm like, I'm like, all right, so let me let me get a different pair of George. Let me get these. So I said, these clean too. So I get them. I'm like, ooh, $55. And I'm looking at old boy, and he just dude ain't got no job. I'm not about to spend $55 on somebody who ain't got no job. And so my wife, and that's why I say stay in the room, because we had to go to count. So my wife looked at me and she seen me like just this complaint. I'm like, I don't want to look. And she said the words that I never wanted to hear. Just stay in the room. Got to go to counseling. She looked at me. She said, baby, let's just go to pay less. I heck no. My son ain't wearing no pay less shoes. I wish I would have my son walking around here in some pay less shoes. So as we took our stroller on our way to pay less, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Call it what you want. You'll see. You'll see. All right. So we get the pay less, right? We get the pay less, and I the lady, and I'm mad, and he don't know that he about to get beat up tomorrow at school with pay less shoes on. He don't even know. And so I asked the girl, and I got an attitude. I'm like, hey, what are the shoes that fit here? Oh, sir, they're over there. And so I go over there, and so I'm looking, I'm like, dang, man. And my son was like, you bring to the table and no one else can tell you anything. Feel good about you. Feel good about the decisions that you make and if they're positive. <laughs> because what will happen is you'll have people who will tell you what you can't do. I don't know if you experienced that already, but you're going to have people in your life that tell you you can't. 
And you're going to have to make a decision whether to believe them or to believe what you know is true. I was talking to this little guy the other day, and, and I was doing a presentation, and the dude had to be like 14 years old. I asked him, you know, who's your favorite team? And he said, you know, I like, I like the, the Tigers. And I said, well, who, who you like for the Tigers? And he told me who he liked. I said, so tell me this. I said, so you mean to tell me, what about in the summertime if you went to a Detroit Tigers camp, and you seen that guy who you like, and you went up to him, you said, man, when I get older, I want to play baseball just like you. What do you think that guy going to tell you? He said, he'll probably tell me that I can do it. I said, he probably will. He'll probably say, you can do it. You got to just stick in there. But what will happen is you'll go home, and this little African-American kid, I said, you'll go home, and you'll get around people, and you'll tell them, man, I just went to this camp, and I spoke to such and such, and he told me I could be a baseball player. And your friend <laughs> will say, man, you can't do that. <laughs> man, man, you can't. But you mean to tell me somebody who's doing it said you can, and your friend who's not doing it said you can't. And you got to believe one of the others. <coughs> who you going to believe? You got people around this room in this program who are helping you, who are telling you you have greatness inside of you, and your future is going to be great. But then you go home, we all got them, and you got people who are going to tell you you can't. So then you got to make a decision, are you going to believe the people who are getting it done, who you're around, or are you going to believe the people who are still a part of your circle? See, one of the hardest decisions I had to make, man, and you do with it what you will, is I had to decide who I was going to allow in my circle. One of the hardest decisions I had to make. Because once I started making that decision, and it wasn't a decision where I just say, hey, man, this school stuff is hard, but come on, man, we can do it together. But all they wanted to do was the other stuff. And so I started separating myself. And these were supposed to be my friends. But then I started hearing from the ones who were my friends, oh, man, you know such and such was talking about. Oh, man, you know they were saying this. I remember working on my, my thesis, and I'm not a good writer, but I remember working on my thesis, and I stopped going to parties and all that because I just wanted to do some more. I had this burn that I wanted something more. I was supposed to be doing something more. I had messed up long enough. I had messed up so many times that I was tired. I was like, it got to be something more because I'm looking outside and I'm seeing people driving in the cars that I want to have. And I'm starting to think in my head, like, if they can do it, why can't I? So I'm sitting up and I'm writing, I'm writing, and I'm, I'm uh, God, man, I'm tired. Of so I, I go to take a break and I drive down the street. And I see one of my friends standing outside the party. And so I make a U-turn, and I go holler at him here in front of, here about, with four, about, about four or five people. And I go mm -hmm. holler at him, I'm like, man, man, what's up, man, good to see you. He was like, D, come here, man. And he pulled me to the side. He said, man, them same dudes that just said what's up to you when you were driving by, they was like, man, D think you better than I said, dog, I said, when I seen you, that's the reason why I came back. Because he was like, man, I'm a, he was ready to fight them dudes. I'm like, man, you ain't got to do that. I said, I just want something different. I said, so it's all good, man. Have fun, be safe. And I left. I started to understand that everybody who calls yourself, who calls yourself your friend, they're not your friend. They're not your friend. And that circle that I talked about, you're going to have to start getting rid of some people. You're going to have to start shaking some people off. And it's not that you're better than them, because none of us is better than anyone. We just choose at some point in our life to start making better decisions. And right now, you're making a choice to make better decisions. So don't continue to go back to the old decisions that you've made before. You've been down that road. It's like that story of the, the lady who, you know, she's walking down the street, walking down the street, <coughs> and she keeps going down the same street, and she keeps falling down a pothole. Then all of a sudden, she go down the same street again, and, and, and she fall down the same pothole. And then the next day, she go down the same street, and she fall down the same pothole. And so finally, when she decides to go down a different street, things change. Because she decided to go down a different street. What's crazy about it is she went down that street three times. And she fell down that same pothole. 
we got to stop falling down the same pothole. But if we do, get up. Get up out the pothole. There's something better. There's something better that you and I are supposed to be doing. There is. There is. There's something better that's inside of you, that's special about you, that maybe your friend haven't figured out yet. And so what happens is everybody's running a race. Everybody's running a race. And people are going to different destinations. And so if you're hanging around the dudes and running their race, then you're going to wind up at their destination and not your destination. Run your own race. Run your own race. So, this goes back to what I was saying about how people who look like you might not always be the people who are going to help you. You might have to get around some different people that will help you. Dr. Scott. Dr. Scott allowed me and two of my friends in the grad school. My one friend named Buki. Ron Brown. So, so Buki, hey, you said I can keep it real, right? I'm going to keep it real with y'all because I don't want y'all to think it. Because understand, if I can do this, y'all can do it. So, so Buki was on campus. This is when we was working on our bachelor's degree. Buki on campus. I see Buki, and I say, Buki, what's up, dog? You all right? Sorry about that. Because he was really smiling a whole lot. And he was like, no, I'm going to. Grad school. And I said, what, you going to grad school? I took Buki. I had Buki for classes. Buki wasn't that smart. How was Buki going to grad school? How Buki going to grad school? I, I know Buki. I thought grad school was for real smart people. Buki said, hey, man, Dick, you got to go talk to this dude named Dr. Scott. He let me into this program that is, 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 is going to be developing mentoring programs and stuff like that. It's in the psychology department. But he let me in, condition, go holler at him. So I rush over to go talk to Dr. Scott. Dr. Scott, older white man. I get in his office, and Dr. Scott said, hey, I remember you. You were quite the athlete. I had to throw that part in there. <laughs> <laughs> he did say that, though. He did say that. Right, right. Lions going to call. All right, so look. So, so he said you were quite the athlete. Buki told you about the program. Well, Ron Brown told you about the program. Well, I'll let you in conditionally as long as you maintain a B average your first semester, and then I'll let you in unconditionally. I had never maintained a B average in my life. I was a football player. That's all I did, football, and went to class because the coaches made me go to class. But I leave his office, and I'm happy. I'm like, oh, I'm going to grad school. I ain't know nothing about grad school. I thought that was for Einstein and some real smart people. And so I was like, oh, I'm Grad school. I see my friend named Paxton. Paxton, like, D, what's up, man? Hi. I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, no. I was like, Pax, dog, I'm going to grad school. Pax looked at me like I was crazy because Pax took classes with me. Pax knew I wasn't that smart. <laughs> grad school for smart people. I said, Pax, you got to go holler at Dr. Scott. So he rushed over. Three of us, we in grad school. We in grad school. So, before we get to grad school, let's go back in that story a little bit. So at the school I graduated from, it was called Chico State. Chico State was a predominantly white institution up there playing football. And so what happened was we had a separate graduation for all the African-American students, right? So we would have that graduation right before the main graduation. So this African-American graduation was held at a church. And it was the day before graduation. And so what you do is you invite your family, your friends to come to this graduation. And so all the graduates, we sitting on we sitting on the stage. We sitting on the stage, and I'm sitting up, and I'm all happy or whatnot. I'm all happy, and I see my mom out there, and everybody just clapping. And so every graduate gets a chance to go up to the mic and thank a person who played a significant role in them graduating. So me and my friends, instead of enjoying the day, we sitting up betting on who gonna cry first. We like, oh, she gonna cry. She look like a crier. So the first person get up. <laughs> And she goes to the mic and she says, I just want to thank my family who are here with me. And they believed in me. And I got it done. And I just want to thank them. And so everybody starts clapping. Ah. So she goes and she sits down. So the next person, we like, oh, dog, she going to cry. She look like a crier. I live by it out. She going to cry. So the next person gets up. She 
goes to her mic. She almost started calling because she sucked it up. She was like, hey, a lot of people didn't know this, but I almost dropped out my freshman year because my uncle was diagnosed with cancer. And I told him, I said, no, I got to come home and take care of you. And he said, no, baby, there's nothing you can do for me. You stay up there and you get it done. And my uncle is here today, and he's cancer-free. So everybody started clapping. Ah, ah, ah. So she goes, sit down. So next person stand up, my last name, Arnold. So I get up. I go to the mic. I look at my mother, and I start crying like a little girl. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm crying. I'm cry You know, the snot and everything. I'm crying. Um, it's a wrap. Because yeah, I'm... I'm looking at mom. The one person who believed in me. She ain't never seen me graduate. Continuation school didn't have graduation ceremony. This is our first time seeing me graduate. So I'm looking at her. I'm crying. I'm crying. And we at the black church. So you know, I'm like, oh, it's okay, baby. It's okay, baby. <laughs> and so I take my attention from my mother. And I said, because I found out that week, and I didn't tell my mother I was going. So I said, you know, I just want to thank my mother because she's always been there for me. And one thing my mother doesn't know, and I'm going to share it with her right now, is that next semester, I've been accepted to go to grad school. And all the ladies like, oh, and they point at their door and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in the ceremony, we go to the stage and everybody, you know, hugging their family or whatnot. My mother rushed over to me. She was like, boy, we in church. You don't be lying in church. You ain't going to no grad school. <laughs> My mother knew my grades. She knew I wasn't that smart. Grad school for smart people. I said, Mom, I said, Mom, I'm going to grad school. The doctor's got to let me in. I just got to maintain a B average. My mother started crying. She was like, really, baby? I said, Mom, I'm going to grad school. So fast forward. Me and my friends, we in grad school. Every day we pushing each other. We pushing each other. Because we ain't know nothing about grad school. All three of us thought it was for real smart people. But if it is, we going to make sure we smart. We going to make sure we get done what we need to get done. And more than anything, we going to push each other. Because it's just us three. It's us three. We pushing each other. We calling each other. We calling each other. We saying, hey, man, damn it. You get that stuff done? You know we got you know to speak tonight because grad school classes were during the evening time. They're three-hour classes. If you ain't get your stuff done, you, it's only so many times. You know how you're in class and the teacher about to call on somebody and you're trying to act like you're invisible? <laughs> he don't see me. He don't see me. It's only so many times you can do that. And so, hey, man, no, I ain't get it done now. Hey, come on, man. I, bought a, I got an extra book from the library. Come on. Just come over to the house, dog. Let's make some eggs. And I used to make eggs. That was my thing. Let's make some eggs. Let's get it done. We would get it done. We would get it done. So we was pushing each other. We was pushing each other. Are y'all pushing each other? Are y'all pushing each other? We was holding each other accountable. It was many times. I ain't going to lie to you. I wasn't getting stuff done. No, dog. You got to get it done. Ain't no, ain't no excuse. We got to make this happen. Come on, man. Is that what y'all saying to each other? Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. I got this coat on. Come on, man. We part of this program. Come on, man. We, we said we're going to get a 3.0. Come on, man. We capable. We can do it. Man, we heard that one dude talk. He got his PhD. Dog, we can do it. He, he said we can do it. Man, I just got from the house, man. Dog, it's, it's, dog you know some crazy stuff happening. Crazy stuff going to happen all the time. Understand that, man. You always going to go through something. It's going to seem like every time you feel like stuff is just good, stuff going to happen. This semester, raise your hand if something went crazy. Put your hands down. This year, raise your hand if something went crazy. Put your hands down. Yesterday, raise your hand if something went crazy. That's life. That's life. I got this book that I wrote, and it's called It's Not a Secret. It's just life, because it was this lady, because I read all the positive, motivating stuff, because I got to have it. I, I, I got to have it. I got to have that positivity in my life. So I read those books on that. This one lady named Rhonda Byrne, she wrote this book called It's a Secret. I don't know if y'all heard about it. It's a secret. <laughs> and so 
I'm like, cause you know, I'm, 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 I'm you know, I, I can hustle. So I wrote this book. I wrote this book. So I wrote this book, and it's called "It's Not a Secret." It's just life. It's just life. Stuff is gonna happen to see if you want it. And that's the thing about the secret. The secret was like, oh, just meditate. So if you go outside and you're looking at your yard, and it got weeds, oh, just meditate. The weeds are gone. No, the weeds is there. And they're about to tear your yard up. I don't care how much meditating you're going to do, they're about to tear it up. Damn, you can't meditate on it. So my book talk about action steps. Stuff going to happen, but action steps. See, that's, that's the difference. When you start turning, I should do this. I should do that. I should have done this into must. That's when you're going to be tight. Because people should all over themselves all the time. That's what they do. They should all over themselves. They always talk about what they should do. <laughs> Turn it into a must. Uh -uh. I started this program. I must get it done. I must get it done. I must get it done. So we on stage again. We on stage because people get their masters graduate with people get their bachelor's. So we on stage and I'm feeling, I'm feeling real good. Got my master's degree. So Everybody like, we sitting up, my guys in bed, who gonna cry? Steve, you know you gonna cry. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna cry. I'm about to let it go. <laughs> it's a wrap. I ain't even got a man up at that point. I, I, I'm good. I, I know I'm gonna cry. Cause that lady right there, sitting right there, that lady is happy as I don't know what. Because my life is changing. My life is changing. Barack Obama said the great equalizer is education. And so what he's saying is, that's what's going to help you be on the same, same playing field. See, I, I don't never brag about my PhD and all that type stuff. Because once I got my master's, it was a wrap. It was like, oh, I get it. All I got to do is ask for help. All I got to do is ask my professors when I don't get something. So what's different about me having my PhD, and the only thing that I can say that I enjoy about it, because there's a lot of things I enjoy about it, but one of the main things is this. I sit at the table. Say what you want, but I sit at the table. So when you're about to make a decision that's going to affect people who look at me, you said, we love y'all because we're looking in the mirror. When I'm looking in the mirror, I'm seeing me. I'm seeing me. And so you mean to tell me you're about to make a decision that's going to affect this man? Oh, no, no, no. I'm here to say, no, we're not going to do that. I get to sit at the table. What tables are you going to sit at because of your education? What tables do you choose to sit at? Because then it becomes a choice. See, that's the difference between having an education and not having an education. When you have an education, you can choose what you want to do. You get tired of your job, you're like, deuces. <laughs> when you ain't got no education, you like, <laughs> what time am I going to be here in the morning? <laughs> Five o'clock? <laughs> Well, you know I got eight other jobs, but I'll be here at 5 o'clock. <laughs> that's the difference. That's the difference. Deuces or... So, we sitting on that stage, telling them I'm about to cry. So I go up there, and I'm about to cry. I'm about to, I'm about to, and then I stop. And I say this. I say, you know, some of y'all was here last time, and some of y'all might have heard that, you know, <laughs> I was boo-hooing last time I graduated with my bachelor's degree. And I said the reason why I was because my mother, you know, was sitting right in front. And I let her down so much. And it got to the point where she said, baby, it's not just me you let down. More importantly, you let down you. She said, baby, and I don't even know if you understand that you're letting down generations. Let me tell you how deep that is. You will have kids. Your kids will have kids. Their kids will have kids. Their kids will have kids. Generations will depend on the decisions that you're making. Grandpa 
David. I remember he was a doctor. See, the difference between the way my kids are growing up right now is it's not a matter of if they're going to college. It's what college are they going to. See, that should ain't a part of my life. It's a must. So I, I tell them, I said, you know, my mother dropped me off at college. And to tell you the truth, when she dropped me off, my mother left. She left. And I was hurting, man. I was crying. I, I, I was crying. But then when I, I got with my, 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 my roommates who was on the football team, I was like, man, I can't cry in front of them. So I had to man it up. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, because I moved my stuff here. Because <laughs> you know how we got here. You know, I was crying. Got on that phone that night. Oh, why you leave me here? <laughs> my mama just dropped me off. My mama later on told me that she cried. It was a nine hour ride. She cried all the way home. But she knew. That's what she had to do. Because it could take me across that bridge to manhood, but that was her way of dropping me off to become a man. So it was on me. It was on me. So I tell them this story. I said, you know, I remember going shopping for the first time. You know, I got my financial aid, check my refund money for football. And so me and my two roommates, we went grocery shopping. And so they went their way, I went my way. And so I'm thinking, because I got a pocket full of money, I'm about to be real good. Shopping for the first time by myself, it's a wrap. When I was growing up, my mother used to get wheat bread. I can't stand wheat bread to this day. I like wonder white bread. That stuff is gooey in your mouth. I like that. <laughs> so I go, and I go down the first aisle, and I get two loaves. I'll be like, yeah, that'll be good. So I go down the next aisle, and this is the aisle that changed my life. So I go down the next aisle, cereal. My favorite cereal to this day is Captain Crunch Berries. <laughs> Captain, man, I'm hungry right now. <laughs> Captain Crunch Berries, that's my thing right there. Ooh, that's my thing. So I go down the second aisle, and I go down the second aisle, I'm like, ooh, because my mother used to get like Cheerios and Raisin Bran. They ain't had it back in the day. So, <laughs> always got to be one. All right. So, so, so I, I, I go down the aisle, I'm like, ooh. Big old bag of Sergeant Bunch. <laughs> yeah, big old bag of Sergeant Bunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't the captain, it was the sergeant. So I walk out. I had to call my mama when I got home. And this is what I told him. I said, I called my mama and I said, Mama, I just want to thank you. She's like, thank you for what, man? She said, You didn't always get me Captain Crunch. This is my favorite series. But I do remember times when you got it. Some people are either willing to pay the cost or they're not. You have to be willing to pay the cost. I talk to a lot of people and they say, oh, man, dang, it took you a long time, I bet, to, to, get, a, to get a PhD. I think, man, I think, man, yeah, get a four-year degree or a six-year degree or even a two-year degree. It's, man, it takes a long time. But I tell you what, ignorance. So it all goes back to decision making. Are you going to make a decision to make it happen and not allow people to tell you that you can't? You're going to have to make a decision of who you're going to believe, the people who are getting it done. And I'm going to tell you, I, I live a great life, phenomenal life. Still got problems. Still got problems.
I'm trying to better myself, and they talking about this and that, and I find myself talking about this and that, because that's what happens. That's what happens. But think about if you're hanging around people who want something.
Think about how many millionaires in the room. And I'm not talking about you right now, because y'all will be millionaires, and y'all be whatever y'all want to. But think about the millionaires in this room. Wow, they made this real pretty. Somebody invented this. They're a millionaire. They solved the problem. You got to wipe your mouth after you eat. This ain't a regular nap. This ain't a regular nap. Those coats over there, they don't hang. Millionaires. You had to put something on your coat, right? You sitting down on chairs. Somebody invented that chair. Millionaire. You got to solve a problem. You got to solve a problem. And you're going to have people who don't agree. And this is my last story. You're going to have people who don't want to share. And you got to remember, don't worry about them. This is it right here. This is it right here. And what that bag is going to do is it's going to go around the can so you can put your trash in and then you can just take it to the dump where the trash goes. They walked away. Man, that ain't never going to, man, that ain't going to work. He said, yes, it is. Yes, it is. He made billions of dollars. Because he created the bag. Last person. This dude's name is Bob. Bob was an old country boy. Bob said, I got this idea. And it's going to make us a whole lot of money. I said, well, what's the idea, Bob? He said, well, I'm going to create this thing called a twisted tie. Just a little piece of cardboard. And what we're going to do with the twisted tie is we're just going to tie it around that bag. And I'm going to make millions of dollars, boys. Man, ain't nobody going to buy no twisted tie. <coughs> and they walked away from him. But he stuck with it. Before they had the new bags that you can tie up like that, they used to have to put them on twisted ties. Twisted ties, little cardboard, little thing. Twisted ties. Made millions. There's ideas that are inside of you that's going to make you millions. But don't be like the richest place on this earth, which is the cemetery. Richest place on this earth. The cure for cancer, the cure for AIDS, all these ideas that would have us in a different place. Richest place on the earth is the cemetery. Don't take that idea and that dream of yours to the cemetery. And even though people won't believe in what it is that you've been thought up, because everything thought, everything that's done today, it was an idea. Believe in you. All goes back to that. If everybody else don't believe in you, you believe in you. That makes sense, gentlemen? Yeah. That's all right? Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Give me some questions. Give me some questions. Yes, sir.
you know, I'm here today sitting in college, doing good, got a good woman, you know, and, and, and people love me today. And you know, those friends that I had out there, they weren't my friends because as soon as I got myself together where they at now, they ain't nowhere. The only one I got in my corner right today, even sometimes, fellas, it can be right in your family too. You know, it can be right in your family. Because like my stepdad, you know, I don't think he liked the fact that I was jumped up and got myself together. You know what I'm saying? My own stepdad. You know, my girlfriend gave me a one year clean celebration party, he didn't even show up. Man, you know that I've been through for the last 20 years of my life. You couldn't even show up. Now see, it just don't be your friends, it be your people in your family too. You know? But my mother is the only one that's there for me. And my girlfriend. That I can honestly say. You know what's crazy about what you said? <clears throat> it's had to go into the dreams and the ideas of the cemetery. I'm blessed that a lot of people can hear my voice, but not everyone's going to hear my voice. <clears throat> it's other voices that will resonate with other spirits. And so if you don't do what it is you were planning on this earth to do, you're not letting down only yourself. You let down young <laughs> men, young women, who needed to hear your voice. So thank you for sharing that. Let's go hear it, then we'll go hear it. Uh, I, my question was, uh, when, in grad school, I mean, how, how did you, uh, you said you navigated with, with networking, but I mean, how long did it take? Man, I was in, to get my, my, my associate's degree, I was there two years, but like with my, when I went to the continuation school, I ended up graduating. And for me, and understand this, I, I didn't understand that the traditional way just didn't work for me. I, grad school, I think the reason why I excelled is because just like with that continuation school, it was up to me. You know, I could have sat there. I knew some people who, they was just sitting there, not doing their work, not doing anything. But I was like, you mean if I read this and do this, I earn this credit? Right. Oh, I'm sitting up there every day like, I mean, they tripping, like, thinking I'm cheating. I'm like, I'm not cheating. I'm just getting done what I need to get done. So I was there a long time, man. I really was. I was two years there. Then it took me five years to get my bachelor's degree. And then my master's. After that, it started clicking. It started clicking. With my PhD, I was, I was fortunate that I was able to work full time. And then they allowed me to work on my PhD as well. But the key was, I'm telling you, gentlemen, the key was I got around people. My fraternity brother was working on his PhD. Now, I got my master's, but PhD, come on, that's a whole nother level. But then I got this I got this fraternity brother, and we sitting in meetings together, fraternity meetings. This dude working on his PhD? He that smart. How you get this? Dog, talk to me, man. How you? Man, it's just like your master's. That's what it is. But, but once again, it turned into a must. I must make it happen. Because now people are like, oh, man, you can't do that. Pfft, watch me. That's what y'all had. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me. Instead of, man, I, I can't stand people. Everybody got haters. Who got haters in the room? All right, everybody got haters. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So if I leave this, get this. If I leave this room right now and I go outside and it's a bird right there and y'all hear me saying, man, I tell you what, the bird better not fly. Y'all gonna think I'm crazy, right? If y'all hear me say, Tell you what, that bird better not fly. Because as I get closer to the bird, what is the bird going to do? I'll be like, oh, man, that bird, I told that bird not to fly. So I'm mad because the bird flew, right? <coughs> so if I go to an aquarium and I'm looking at the fish inside the aquarium, what are the fish doing? Swimming. Because fish do what? Birds do what? Fish do what? Haters do what? So how the heck I want to fight a person who's doing what it is they naturally do? So I'm just as crazy as that dude that I see saying, the bird better not fly. And did it fly. Understand, when haters are hating on you, it's just your turn. Haters hate on everybody, but now it's your turn. So don't get mad and want to fight. No, I can't get hating on me. That's what they do. Y'all told me birds fly, fish swim. Haters hate. Make sense? All right, go ahead. Just there, just there.